Amy. Hi, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Excellent. This has been a lot of fun getting to this point here. It has been a process. Where we're sitting. Yes. Technology is working. So far. Uh, I hit record. Yeah. Our exactly. batteries are working on our devices. Cameras aren't falling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, um, we have a lot of people listening in who are interested in knowing what we're talking about, not knowing how we got here. So Amy McGeechee, you're a very well-known person in this market. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a topic. I really like the topic you and I came up with. And it mm. is top designer spills the beans and leaves us with a kiss. Ooh. <laughs> That's a pretty good topic. So for those of you watching this as a video on YouTube, it's also a podcast, so you can listen to it on your mobile device. If you're listening to it uh, as a podcast now, you can go back and also watch this as a video because there are some great tips that Amy has, first on how you got to have such notoriety in your business, but then also the systems and processes you've put in place in your design business to bring right. value to your clients, which is really why we're here. Yes, and create profitability and all of that. Yeah. So let me stop talking. Weird. And I'll start with this. Amy McGeechee, who are you and why would you be talking to cabinet makers, architecture, mill workers, designers all around the English speaking world? Okay. Well, here you go. So I am a designer with a background in kitchen and bath design, which is different than a lot of interior designers out there. Anybody can make a kitchen look great. However, when it comes to functionality and all of the math and background that has to go into it, a lot of designers don't necessarily specialize in that or know how to do it. So having that as a background is great. And then also have the media side of things as well. So having a TV show where we talk about trends and design and all the latest products out there and educate the viewers on that. So you have a TV show. It's called Trend. It is, yes. And you're, I mean, people that don't know you don't know this, but you're quite a celebrity. Well, I wouldn't say I mean, that. That's what, I know you wouldn't. If which you is ask what, my mother or grandma, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, it is true, though. You're really well known in your local market. And, and so we have designers listening here. We have people that are interested in marketing themselves because they do great work. They're passionate about, about what they do, just like you, and they want to reach more people. Can we do our first system talk? The kit. KISS, by the way, for everybody here. Well, Amy, what does KISS stand for? Well, first of all, it's not that kind of podcast or show. So keep it stupid or keep it simple, silly, we'll say. For the yeah. purpose of we won't the say show. keep it simple, stupid because it's a family show. It's yeah. K-I-S-S stands for keep it simple, silly, <laughs> Stanley. Whichever Siobhan, for you. whoever you are. Makes you think of it. So the first system is, let's talk about this notoriety. I mean, you're on a really well-respected show. You have a loyal following, people who love you. Suppliers want to be featured on your show. And you generally, you've created this magnetism around yourself and your personal brand, which is great, but it, it's not easy. It's not, no. it's not simple. Sorry, I no. shouldn't say it's... And so can you tell us a little bit about your system for that? If you just really had to lay it out, in basic steps for somebody who wants to follow in your uh, in your footsteps, how would I do that? I think with anything, it's really it seems overwhelming and like a big deal, say getting on television or contacting the people to get to those points. But with anything, it's really just breaking it off in chunks and making it simple. So it might just be contacting that one person that you are intimidated to contact whether that be the president of a tv station or something like that just making that phone call and making the connection because um in victoria where we are and i'm sure in any other city it's the same way but it's really all about who you know and making the relationships and connections to solidify yourself as an expert and therefore creating your branding around mm -hmm. that it all starts with that first conversation no matter what it is yeah. It doesn't matter who you're talking to. You don't know how they're connected. Well, you and I, for example, we met at an NKBA event and just got talking about our backgrounds and decided this would be a good fit. You thought of me. And, and, and then we're open to it as well. Like we're just yeah, open to the exactly. opportunity and yes. not, oh, I don't know. And, oh, always say yes. Why would you say no to something that intimidates you or scares you until you, you will be able to do it. It's not that you won't be able to do it. You just have to 
you know, do things that scare you. Yeah, do, you know, there's uh, at, at one of my favorite Starbucks, which is a loaded statement in itself. Right. One of my favorite Starbucks, there's a church next door that has one of those signs where they put those clever sayings, right? Yes. And uh, one of the most the favorite ones I've ever read on it is a mind once expanded will never again regain its original shape. That's great. It yeah. is. It was a good one, right? And, and that's what you're talking about here is, you know, be open to the possibilities but, and then follow them. Absolutely. Right? Don't go yeah. shrink back into your old self. And don't just sit around waiting for opportunities to happen either because it's very rare that they come knocking on your door. If you want change, if you want something big to happen, go out there and start the process. Start creating those opportunities. Yeah. There's an opportunity in front of all of us right now to get that next big thing happening. That's true. And right? especially in our marketplace right now, because technology is so rapidly changing in media as well as everything, nobody really knows what that next step is yet. So I think until it comes knocking on their door, whether that be television, media, any of those things, or your clients, they don't know they need you until they do until they're excited about your product and your brand and they want to be a part of that or they want you to be a part of them. Right. So I, I think your keep it simple on the media side is just make that first contact, reach out, be open to. Convince people that they need your brand or don't even convince them, educate them. You don't have to convince somebody, but educating them that what you have and your brand, your product, all of that is something that they need. <laughs> It's interesting that you say it that way, because if you recall, at the NKBA meeting, uh, sorry, for those people listening who, who don't, uh, the acronym, they may not have heard it before, NKBA is the National Kitchen and Bath Association. And I was a guest speaker, and that's where I met Amy and as I was presenting, but I was presenting on sales to homeowners. Yes. And the topic was about the sales process, mm -hmm. and then the subtopic was how to help them buy from you, which is what you just said. It's not about selling my brand to them. It's about showing where I can add value to them. So it makes it easy for them to say, hey, Amy, would you like to host a TV show called Trend? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> right. Be open to the possibility. So that's great. So there's a system that you put in place. And I, I like the way you approach things with simplicity. Do you do that in your design work as well? I do. Yes. Um, it's the simplicity is part of a much bigger picture. So it may be a complex design, but each piece can be broken down into a simple manner. So starting out, so you're not looking at everything can be overwhelming if you just start looking at the big picture. It's really creating those systems and making the first step with anything. Hmm. So that's interesting because I think about it from the consumer side, the person you're selling to. So just right. for the sake of it, say a homeowner, myself and my wife are sitting in front of you. Uh, in, in my particular case, my wife's got a great eye for design, but I cannot translate flat plans into what I'm going to walk through or have as a kitchen or a wine mm -hmm. area. Do you find that it's, do you find that that simplicity is required to help everybody in the buying group understand or? It is absolutely. Cause a lot of people, like you said, it, it's a partnership between wife and husband or however that looks, but one may be able to visualize the end product, the other has no idea. So the simpler that we can make it for them, whether that's great 3D renderings or even walkthroughs now with our software, things that they can just visualize the end product and then whatever it takes to get there, they can get on board with that. It takes a certain amount of knowledge to know so much, but make it sound like it's just dead simple. Absolutely. It's if, as if a surgeon was explaining to you what they're going to do for your open heart surgery. I would glaze over right there and I would just be scared by the whole process. But I think that if they can kind of dub it down for me and right. let me know my responsibilities, what they need from me and, you know, handhold do the whole thing, it makes it a much easier process. Yeah. Much easier and also much more respectful because if you're explaining things to me and it's really complicated, now I feel dumb and I'm not going to ask you the questions. And there's a distance between us because you're smarter and I'm not. And Well, and the thing is, too, that I think a lot of people don't realize is if the designer or the salesperson is doing a good job, it really has nothing to do with me. I'm just helping my clients get to the end result that they'll be happy with. Mm. So actually, that's a great transition point. 
let's talk about your KISS process, your keep it simple, Simon, uh, yeah. process for finding the right people. How do you just narrow it down or boil it down to the most key essentials to finding the right people who can work with you? Right, because it really, I mean, it's a very personal relationship with your clients because they're inviting you into the home. It may not be a good personality fit for them or me. So qualifying ahead of time and having all a list of the questions that you need to go through with um, new potential clients, whether that be from a cold call or a walk-in, and really walking through those questions to see if they're even a good fit for you. Because if there's red flags going off on either side, don't take it. I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> so are you, are you saying, mm -hmm. let me change this into a coaching question. Okay. Amy, if I suggested that you could no longer take that list into a first meeting, right. how would you feel about that? That's okay, because I would have it memorized ah, okay. inside and out. So. I'm still going to go through all those questions in my mind or the listening. It's, it's all about listening to people and what they're expecting from me and just seeing if that's a good fit. But you wouldn't skip that step is what I'm yeah. hearing. Never. So it has to happen. It has to happen. Yes. And on the times that you haven't followed your system, the times you haven't done the list of questions for a new client, how has that turned out for you or them? I find that we don't maybe we don't, follow or meet the requirements on one side or the other, or sometimes both. It's just not a good relationship. Um, you know, and I mean, love and hate TV shows right now, but a lot of people honestly come to us who think that cabinetry can be ready to go in a weekend and it's going to cost them $500 and it's going to look like extreme home makeover and be so much fun. Right. Um, no, it doesn't happen that way. And if they think that it does, then they're not the right client for me. Mm. And I think also on the other side too, um, you know, I may not be the right fit for somebody if they're not open to uh, suggestions and budgets and all those sorts of things. Cause it really has to be an open communication for everybody. Yeah. Well, you mentioned red flags. I very often in the beginning, you always just want to take the job because right. it's work. You don't ever want to say no. Well, I didn't, you don't want to say no to it. And those are always the ones that end up being a bit of a disaster. Ones that I don't like thinking about. <laughs> yeah, but those are red flags we should pay attention to. Absolutely, and it's not necessarily for you know, any negative reason on one person, it's just that it's not a good fit. So how did you recognize when it was time in your business to recognize the red flags and listen to them? Because I, I agree, we all see them, but then we choose to ignore them. But at some point you decided hey, I'm growing, or it's in order to grow. So tell us about that a little bit. A lot of it would be time management. If we, we looked back and saw, okay, where are we spending all of our hours that we're not making money on? And a lot of those were coming from um, either high maintenance clients or jobs where they just weren't going smoothly because, you know, for whatever reason, there was all sorts of service issues or those sorts of things. And so learning to eliminate those from the beginning and mm. really take the jobs that are in our niche that fit properly. Yeah. I love the fact that you said that. In, when I approach training business owners in this industry, we break it down to four ingredients that have to be there for any sale. And so right. I've got my own KISS system. And, it, and I found myself that when I'm ignoring it, it comes up to smack me in the butt. Got it. Again, later. Really but, hard. Really hard, and what's even worse is I'm doing the smacking because I knew what I was doing when I. Oh, yeah. But there, the the four elements. It's actually four plus two. It's I have to understand, and they have to understand their budget. Right. The need. Timing, which you already mentioned, it's not a home makeover show that happens in this magical weekend. No. no. Right? Yeah. Relationship. So we have to have. There has to be a fit. I have to like you enough professionally and personally. Yes. And then there's two technical industry specific questions or concerns. Mm -hmm. And my job is to find out what they are from the person I'm sitting in front of and deal with them. But if I don't, those questions will find me later and they will punch me in the head. Yes, exactly. Every time. <laughs> Every time. Yeah. yeah.
there's an author by the name of Vern Harnish, and he wrote a really great book. It's called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Now, it's a great book, but it's a horrible read. It's super heavy. <laughs> well, there's lots to learn from it. Right? Lots to learn. It took me a couple times to read it, but it's, a, it's actually a system for business improvement for putting strategic planning in place. But one of the things that he says in that book is really has stuck with me for years, and it's that systems set you free. That's true. Absolutely. Right? Having a system is what sets us free. And I feel like it's always a work in progress because it's like having a business plan. It needs to be a working business plan because everything is always changing as you go. It can't just sit and it has to be uh, moving and evolving with you. So coming up with systems that are constantly improving your time, improving yeah. whether it's easier for clients, that sort of thing, and your bottom line, doing things that will help make a bigger profit. Do you have a way that you like to keep your systems? I, I'm well, it's, again, this is a work in process, progress, but we're trying to do everything digitally now. So, and in clouds, so mm -hmm. we can, all of my designers and such, we can have access to them at all times um, and not be looking for paperwork or notes, or if you do have those things, to be scanning them into our project management software and having everything categorized by jobs mm -hmm. and have it also where our clients can see certain things as well. So when we give them homework, those tasks are in there and they get the satisfaction of checking them off and also seeing what we're working on too. So it's never a question as to, I haven't heard from you for three days. What's going on? You forgot about me. Well, no, we're actually working on your renderings. Or... So let's talk about your team for a second, if we can, we won't name names. No, but uh, everybody on this call or listening to this is a, is a business owner as well. Have you found resistance from your team when you said, Hey, here's a system I'd like us to follow. Not at all. And I mean, I would say, well, our demographic is a little bit, they're younger than me. So they're much more open to change and progress, but they're usually pushing me to dial things in and make it more organized. I'm the artistic creative type. I like the Tasmanian devil, you know, like going around in circles and I am not the most organized person. I'm the first person to say that. So the more systems that are in place and the more organized my team is, the more organized they keep me. Mm. So they're the ones that are pushing me to create these systems and everybody to stick to them. Right. But you've also found within yourself, you've recognized that that's where you want, you keep moving towards systems, even though you're that creative person who sees things yeah. in multicolor, well, multi-angles. Hey. So I know that it's something that I constantly have to work on is being organized, being in check and just trying to keep it all. Because a lot of it's in, as new business owners or entrepreneurs, we always have a lot going on in our head mm -hmm. and we tend to keep it all up there. So being able to pull all of that out and have access to my team or for my team to have that so they don't have to ask me questions as to what's going on with this, what's going on with that. It's it's out of my head and it's out there for everybody. Yeah. Have you found that having those systems gives your team a common language and that common language lets you pinpoint, well, challenges or opportunities that much faster? Does your team take, take advantage of that shared language of a system? Absolutely, yes. And then they can all communicate based on those systems and such. And it also, it's great too, because it keeps everybody accountable as well. So if we have, if everybody's gone through the proper steps and systems, we know that we're not missing anything. Hmm. You know, I'm no expert in CRM and, and uh, are you familiar with what CRM is? Mm -hmm. Customer relationship management. It's a software you'd put Amy McGeechy, owner of this company, phone number, contact employees, etc. That's a CRM for those people listening. And, and I've often talked to business owners who say, well, we bought that CRM, but it doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, Salesforce doesn't work. Yeah. It might be too much gun for the bear. That's a big, hairy application that can do everything but what i have found and i wonder if you found the same thing is that when we don't use the system the system doesn't work it's correct when we don't yeah. use the crm the crm doesn't work but they also aren't as dialed in as they they won't know what their closing ratios are or you know their percentages and such how could you if you're not recording all of that right closing ratios following your closing ratios yes so to some people on the line, and that's why people are listening, that might be something they've either visited in the past and not followed through on, or it's the first time they're hearing it and they're curious about it. Can we talk about just that piece 
of running the business called closing ratios. And I'd be interested if anybody else has feedback out there that's listening to Amy and I, shoot us a note afterwards if you have anything to add. But so let's start with what is a closing ratio and why is it important? For me? Yeah. Oh. Gosh, it's one of the most important things. Um, if you aren't able to close a sale, you're just wasting your time. But right. so I, I think actually you were one of the ones that said this at the NKPA. If your closing ratio is 100% too, you're a liar. Or, you were doing <laughs> or, or you're a drug dealer. I did say, or you're a drug dealer. Or a drug dealer, yes. Yeah. But then it kind of sells itself, right? Like, <laughs> I guess, yeah. 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 So yeah, I, closing ratio is like a batting average. How many times do I go to bat and how many hits, how many times did I actually get a hit? So if I, if I pitched 10 times this month and I got five deals, my closing ratio is 50%. Mm -hmm. And then you caught on to what I'd said there in the training is that a high closing ratio is not an indicator of skill. It's yes. actually an indicator of a potential problem. Yes. Yeah. It is. It's true. Yeah. And just for the people listening who are like, what's the potential problem, Dom? Because I have an 80% closing ratio. Mm -hmm. So can I talk about it for a second? Of course. Yes. So a closing ratio is, as I said, how many times you go to uh, do your sales presentation. We'll use that. There's a number of closing ratios in a sale. We'll just use the one between where I've got my final proposal in front of the buyers. Um, if my closing ratio, if you're listening to this call and you think your closing ratio is 75 or 80%, then my position is you have a problem because a high closing ratio means one of two things. Number one, you're leaving money on the table. So you could be charging a little bit more because you should actually have a bit of a lower closing ratio or you're not accurately counting your closing ratio and you're only counting people who are going to close anyways, which feels good until you listen to the last 10 seconds of this podcast. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So closing ratio is an important thing to measure. And, and you do keep it so simple. I think probably like the design elements that you put into a home, you don't want to clutter it up. You want to keep things simple. Mm -hmm. Same with a business. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about some of your KISS systems for production, for managing sub trades. Absolutely. Let, so let me ask, have you found sub trades to not have systems and find that to be a challenge in your business? Yes. Well, for instance, I had one of my sub trades call me the other day to see if I had an invoice they had sent me back from April. Uh, you were the one that created the invoice. How do you not have that? So anyways, yeah. a lot of them, I, a lot of trades aren't business people, which I can totally appreciate. It's not their talent. Right. But the thing is, when it's not your talent, it's recognizing things that you need help with, you need systems, you don't do well, and paying somebody else to do that. Because that's when businesses fail. Right. So I think having systems in place for that, whether it be your bookkeeping, managing, your sub-trades, uh, we have project management software. So essentially, we create milestones. Um, we have all sorts of uh systems within that to track orders, to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks, to make sure there aren't any delays on things. Right. So you had a mill work delay. Tell us about that. The machine actually broke down at the shop. And so because the mill work is delayed a few days now that we can't install the countertop, we can't install the backsplash and everything. The entire renovation is pushed back a few days. But at least with our project management software, we can put all of that into the calendars. It notifies the client right away to let them know that there's delays mm. as well as all the other trades that are joined into that particular job. Excellent. So it's nice to have those systems in place. It is, yes. And backup systems. Do, backup do, systems do we have a backup system in place today, Amy? Our backup system was your iPad just crashed. But it took you seconds to come back online on your phone. So thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I was laughing when you were talking about things falling through the cracks. And this is, this is an old business coach joke because it's actually not funny and I'm an old business coach. But can I tell it? Yeah. I was uh, coaching a company that did home renovations. So they're like Mr. Fix-It type services. And the question on the table was how do we increase sales? 
and so sort of as a casual comment I threw out to the owner, I said, well, did you check behind the seat in the van, in the vans? They had drivers out there in the vans. And uh, I won't name the, the name. Uh, he, he was like, what? I'm like, you, did you check behind the driver's seats? Because I remember when I ran my painting company, I would get to the truck, open the van door, throw everything on the seat, put all my stuff away. Then I'd jump in, I'd sit on the invoice, and it would slide through the back. So, as you know, I like to have fun with what I do. So I'm like, well, humor me and go out and check. And so he found a couple of invoice, like a, at the time they were still paper visa receipts. Yes. Behind the seats of the truck, or the van. So literally between the cracks. In between the cracks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean the crack in the seat, not, yeah. this was not a plumbing company as an example. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, this has been excellent. I mean, really great. And I think also a testament to just driving forward, which is what we talked about earlier. Keep it simple. Stay calm. Put your value proposition forward. You and I have had quite the adventure getting this call recorded. It is recorded now? <laughs> nice shot. Thank you. So for those of you listening who didn't catch this, I didn't record our entire first interview, which was flawless. It was pretty amazing. It yeah. was a really, this one's good too. This one's good too. Um, but I still think we covered off a lot of valuable information and the information that you shared today, people are walking away thinking, you know what? She's right. You need to do that. Thank you. Actually, Amy, if people want to get in touch with you and learn more about what you do, who you are, how would they find you? We'd love to see you on social media on our Instagram page. Uh, we're um, at Magichi Amy, and that's, it's not, it sounds Japanese, it's not, it's Scottish. It's uh, M C G E A C H Y A M Y. Um, we post all sorts of stories and design tips and such on there, so we'd love for you to follow us. And we're also on Facebook as well. Great. Well, and, and for my part, I'll post links to your website and your Instagram on the show notes, which accompany the, uh, the, au the audio version, the podcast version, so people can link through there as well. Excellent. Thank you. Amy, thank you. It's been a great interview. I think we've learned a lot of things, and you've kept, again, you've kept it simple and straightforward, all actionable, which I love. Perfect. Thank you so much for thinking of me. Absolutely. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. See you.